So good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to the master class organized by Indian Society of Hematology and Blood Transfusion. Our speaker uh, today is a well-known and reputed hematopathologist, Dr. Ruchi Gupta, ma'am who is an additional professor in the Department of Hematology, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. Today's topic of discussion is lab diagnosis of sickle cell disease. Please feel free for any, to ask any queries. You can uh, write up your queries in the chat box. And, and at the end of the session, there will be a question answer session where your questions will be asked directly to Ruchi Gupta, ma'am. So now I want to invite Dr. Ruchi Gupta, ma'am, to start today's session. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you, Moshu, for such a kind introduction. Uh, can I uh, start uh, sharing my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So is my screen visible? Yeah, ma'am, just ma make it full screen. Right. It is visible now, Moshmi? Yes, ma'am. That's all. Okay. So, um, so topic for today's discussion uh, is laboratory diagnosis of sickle cell disease. But uh, before we actually move on to the laboratory aspect of the sickle cell disorder, I will actually also be touching upon in brief uh, about the origin of the disease and uh, the, its pathogenesis. Because that actually forms an important component when you are uh, dealing with any disorder in the lab. So you really need to know what uh, is the clinical presentation and what all you, uh, in that relation, what all you expect to do in the lab and how to interpret the data which is generated by those lab tests. So if you, uh, you know, for people who do not know of the sickle cell, so first described way back uh, by uh, James, Dr. James Herrick in 1910, when he said that uh, he has seen something which was never been described before and that was sickle-shaped cells in a young male. And then it took almost uh, two decades for them to identify. Uh, it was Dr. Ingram who uh, identified that the sickle cell uh, is a consequence of the mutation in the beta globulin gene. And uh, almost two decades later, that is in the 1950s, did it come to be known that it has an uh, autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance and has a carrier state wherein one of the genes is mutated and other is normal. And it can be passed on to the next generation and you can have a homozygous condition, which is broadly known as sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell disease is usually used, uh, you know, a little more loosely for all those uh, disorders which are uh, co-inherited with sickle cell mutation and result in sickling. Whereas usually we use the word sickle cell anemia for a homozygous sickle cell uh, mutation. Uh, and if you look at uh, this disease, it's a, it's a global health problem, though it seems to be have arisen in Africa and uh, it is uh, very, very prevalent in uh, Africa. But then uh, besides the sub-Saharan African region, we have the Mediterranean and the Middle East and the Asia where it's where also we uh, have people and a good going load of people who are, who are carriers of this disease. In India, if we look at the prevalence, it is as high as 40% in some of the states particularly in central India and states like Madhya Pradesh, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Gujarat. Here, uh, this is a major health problem. So, you know, this all basic and background information is, is important when you, you know, you, uh, in, particularly for all uh, hemoglobinopathies, you know, there are some regions in the country where, you know, that is more prevalent. So, like sickle, as I said, here in central India and in the uh, southern areas, whereas we have HBE in the eastern areas, part, eastern parts of the country, and then uh, HBD Punjab is more prevalent in the western western side and uh, in Punjab and so on. So when uh, when you deal with a patient, you know the uh, area which the patient belongs to becomes an important component of the history you take, and also from uh, where he has come, and you know you should know that what kind of hemoglobinopathies are prevalent in those areas. So what is interesting that though uh, sickle cell mutation is typically due to that uh, A to T transition at the beta 6, uh, sixth position of the beta globin gene uh, in the sixth codon basically, but this mutation appears to have arisen spontaneously at least five times. And uh, this has been uh, brought forward by studying the different haplotypes by RFLP analysis. And if you look at the different types, we have the Senegal, Benin, Bartu, Cameroon, and Arab region. So I know that, you know, there might be some people who ma'am, lab diagnosis, tha, ye sab kya, what are you discussing? But actually, it is important to know that there are different haplotypes. Why? Because the disease severity is dependent upon the haplotype or the kind of uh, 
a mutation which is there in that particular person. Like the Bantu is considered to be a very severe form of the disease, whereas people with the Arab Indian haplotype or the Senegal Arabian have a relatively milder phenotype. And this is also possibly due to the presence of a raised HPF level which has been observed in these haplotypes. So this is the basic uh, defect which we have in sickle cell disease. That is, there is an A to T transition in codon 6 of the beta globin gene because of which there is a change in the amino acid from glutamic acid, which is a hydrophilic uh, amino acid at that position. Now that gets replaced by a hydrophobic amino acid, that is the valine. So this is just a uh, diagrammatic representation of the amino acid. And at the sixth position, we can see that there is a change from glutamic acid to valine. Sorry. So what happens because of this change? So because of this change inside the RBCs, if you see the hemoglobin molecules, when the cell is oxygenated, the cell, the hemoglobin molecules are in a free form. They allow the red cell to be soft, malleable, deformable, and pass through the capillaries. However, the moment it gets deoxygenated, these uh, hemoglobin tetramers, they tend to polymerize. And eventually they reach a stage of nidus formation or nucleation, which subsequently leads to the formation of these polymers. So here, if you can see that uh, the projection and the indentation is de uh, depicting the mutated sickle cell. And because of this mutation, there is a tendency of these tetramers to, you know, adhere to each other and result in the formation of a, of a polymer. And once this polymer starts to form, then initially it is a reversible phenomena, but subsequently the cells become irreversible sickle cells, which we see on the smear of a patient with sickle cell disease. So there are many factors which can contribute to the sickling besides the hemoglobin concentration, the pH, the temperature. As I initially said that this tetramer which uh, kind of co-polymerizes each other, each other are uh, usually reversed back to their soluble forms once the, when the, once the red cells get oxygenated. But then there is a stage where the critical polymers or more than 30 tetramers are, you know, they co-aggregate uh, and result in the formation of a uh, gelation process this is known as and then at this time point this phenomena of polymerization becomes irreversible and this phenomena of polymerization is actually the main reason of the presentation and the pathogenesis of this disorder so uh, as i just said that the hemoglobin concentration ph temperature ionic strength uh, any cone concurrent infections dehydration things like these can lead to or lead to the precipitation of this hemoglobin X and its uh, subsequent manifestations. So what is the impact of other uh, genetic mutations if there is a co-inheritance? Like if there is a co-inheritance of a uh, beta uh, allele which has mutated for sickle, if there is a co-inheritance for HBC, HBD or HBO Arab, this sickling process is facilitated. They have, because of the charge, they tend to co-polymerize, whereas molecules like HbA, A2, and F, they are not really interested in being a part of these polymers. And so if you see the heterozygous sickles are usually kind of asymptomatic. People who have a co-inheritance of uh, HPFH or in states where are, there are mutations where the HPF levels are increased, like in XM1 polymorphism, this sickling is retarded. And consequently, the symptomatology of the patient or the incidence of vasoocclusive crisis goes down. And there are multiple other uh, genetic as well as non-genetic modifiers which eventually affect the presentation of the disease. Amongst these, the major ones are the Arab Indian haplotype, which I just mentioned. Then in patients who have higher levels of HBF, they will have a less severe phenotype. If there is coexisting alpha chain uh, deletion, then again, the severity of the disease goes down. Besides these genetic modifiers, there are a number of non-genetic modifiers like uh, infections and dehydration, altitude, smoking, and so on, which predisposes pe uh, people with sickle cell disorder to have vasoocclusive crisis. So these patients usually do not come to us, you know, as a workup of part of in India. Rather, they are they present more with the complications because of the polymerization inside the cell which actually leads to a deformation of the red cell. There is a, a flip-flop of the RBC membrane and we have exposure of phosphodiesterase serine on the outer side, which leads to a hypercoagulable or a procoagulant state. There are, these cells tend to adhere. There is hypoxia. There is dec decrease in the nitric oxide. There is vasoconstriction and so on. And all this unique environment and the unique genetic makeup 
influences the disease phenotype and is uh, decisive for the clinical severity. And as I just mentioned, so these are the multiple factors which actually contribute to the vasoocclusive crisis for which these patients actually come to the uh, hospital and not like you know any other uh, hemoglobinopathy where anemia is that is uh, that persistent problem as compared to these painful crises which patients with uh, sickle cell anemia or uh, compound heterozygous sickle beta and so on do face. So uh, if we actually see how it manifests, then it will not manifest at birth because we all know that it takes almost one year for the uh, gamma globin chains to go down. So the initial maybe three to four months are very protective for the child because of the presence of high levels of HPF. However, as subsequently there is a switch from the uh, gamma chains to the, uh, to the beta uh, globin chains and we have more of HPA. At that time point, because the, the A is mutated or the gene is mutated and we have a sickle hemoglobin, so these children start becoming symptomatic during the second half of the first year of their life. And at that time point, if you actually see, there will be mild hemolytic anemia, which starts becoming apparent by three to six months of age, and spinomegaly can be noted after six months of age. Subsequently, these people will go on to have a state of mild hemolytic anemia continuously throughout their childhood as well as adolescence. The hem so this is specifically for patients who are sickle cell disease. So they'll have uh, some degree of anemia, they'll have some degree of reticulocytosis and so on. And then it is a multi-system disorder. They can come to us with, you know, neurological complications, gallstones, asplenia, papillary necrosis, priapism, leg ulcers, and avascular necrosis. So these are uh, in the acute stages, we have acute chest pain and backache. So these uh, patients will have, uh, you know, such, uh, they come to the department for workup of such painful crisis. And when you look at their indices and so on, you will underline that, understand that what is basically going on. So let us see, if, suppose this is a child I had in, uh, for workup. He's a three-year-old child who's a resident of Jharkhand who's presented with pallor, complaint of abdominal pain on and off. On examination, there is ictus and myospinomegaly. There's no history of transfusion in the past and the parents are asymptomatic. So this, I have purposefully added that he is a resident of Jharkhand because this is again giving us a clue as to what are we going to deal with. He looks like a hemolytic anemia and now he has probably a, some vasoocclusive crisis because of which he's having abdominal pain. So if I have to work up these patients in the lab, I'll probably divide this for the purpose of teaching into screening tests, confirmatory tests, and molecular tests. The screening would start with the evaluation of the complete blood counts and uh, peripheral smear examination. Further, if you see what you want to see, that is the presence of those sickle cells, we'll go ahead and do a sickle solubility or a sickling test. And even newborn screening comes as an important part of screening. Further then to go on and confirm our findings of the screening, we'll need specific tests which will show us and document the presence of this abnormal hemoglobin that is by either hemoglobin electrophoresis, HPLC or capillary electrophoresis. I should have added isoelectric focusing as well. And uh, molecular tests are usually not required for you know straightforward or clear-cut cases. But yes, we'll discuss where we have the role of molecular analysis. So coming on to uh, screening, uh, so what would the CBC show us? So a patient who is heterozygous, as I've said, that a heterozygous patient is almost always, uh, almost asymptomatic. I cannot say always, there can be some acute conditions where these patients also might have a uh, sickling crisis. But usually if you see the heterozygous sickle cell patients are almost asymptomatic. They're even their red cell indices, unlike a beta thalassemia trait are also completely silent. Unless you may have some coexisting alpha thalassemia, or you have a coexisting second mutation along with uh, a beta sickle mutation because of which the patient has presented to you. So if I, uh, so the second mutation could actually be a change in another amino acid besides the switch from glutamic, glutamic acid to belly. And because of the second mutation, like the presence of hemoglobin as Antilles or Oman or Jamaica plane, these are uh, personally to me also this is more theoretical and we are yet to, yet to see such cases. But it is known that patients who are heterozygous for sickle cell, if they have some other coexisting mutation, so they will retain their property of, the cells will retain their property to become a sickle. 
but the electrophoretic correcting mobility of the second result of the second mutation might result in additional uh, band on uh, HPLC and electrophoresis or it might co migrate with HBS. So in these conditions, eventually you will have to put up, you will have to uh, put up molecular tests to resort this situation. So uh, I'll bring this uh, forward with an example. Here we have, this was a father of a patient uh, who, were getting, who was getting worked up. So we have a 40 year old male who was otherwise asymptomatic. His hemoglobin is uh, 12.4 normal. The RBC count appears to be slightly higher. MCV is uh, MCV, MCH, and MCHC are reduced. RDW is almost close to near normal or mildly elevated. There is hardly any reticulocytosis. And if we did, did an HPLC in this patient because he was getting screened as a part of the screening procedure, here what we can make out is that in the sickle window, the percentage of HBS is 26.9%. Your indices are microcytic hypochromic. So we can start suspecting that there might be a coexisting alpha thalassemia because of which the percentage of sickle has gone down. Actually, the slide probably should have been incorporated a little later when I have already talked about uh, HPLC. But normally I can uh, add on over here itself that normally on HPLC, a heterozygous would have the percentage of sickle to be around 35-40%. But in the presence of alpha thalassemia, as we can see from the indices also where we started suspecting that with a microcytic hypochromic picture and a traced uh, RBC count, when I have this in hand that the HBS is also on the lower side, I would suspect that probably there is a co-inheritance of alpha thalassemia or a loss of alpha gene as well. So suppose this is the index case coming back to the case who was a three-year-old uh, child with uh, anemia and abdominal pain and so on. So he is anemic. There is uh, almost moderate to severe anemia with a hemoglobin of seven gram per deciliter. The RBC count is kind of normal or I would say slightly elevated. And again, here we have some microcytic hypochromic indices. The RDW is high and there is some degree of reticulocytosis. So this indicates that you have an anemia. There is microcytic hypochromic picture and then there is reticulocytosis. So given in this situation, since we know we are dealing with the case of, we are talking today about sickle cell. So if I look over here, normally what you expect in a patient with uh, homozygous sickle, that the uh, for the given uh, hemoglobin concentration, normally the MCV and MCH are in the normal range. But if it's a heterozygous state with sickle and beta thyroid, you will have coexisting microcytosis for the same degree of hemoglobin. And that is where your uh, CBC will give you, probably on retrospect, will give you a suggestion that it is not a homozygous sickle and probably you are dealing with a condition of sickle and uh, with co-mutation of the beta, uh, with co inheritance of beta thalassemia. And this is how, you know, people have shown and uh, how to go about interpreting and correlating the hemoglobin and the MCV values with different genotypes of the sickling syndromes. Like I said, as I said, normally in homozygous sickle, the median hemoglobin is around between 6 to 12. It can be, median could be 8 or 9. And usually the indices, even in a homozygous sickle, are normal. MCV, MCH, MCHC are silent, meaning thereby that they'll not give you any clue as to what is the underlying disorder unless until you go ahead and do a specific test. Whereas in states like sickle beta 0 or sickle beta plus, the MCV would be reduced. Sickle beta plus would have a relatively better hemoglobin because in the presence of beta plus some degree of A or the normal adult hemoglobin is also being formed. Then we have SD Punjab, ORF and conditions like where you have F uh, which is elevated like S with HPFH. There if you see the median hemoglobin is as high as 30 and the indices are almost silent and there is no microcytosis. So frankly speaking, when you really see a case who comes to the lab and you look at the indices, you really don't know that it is sickle. Then some of your indices might not give you that much clue. But when you are suspecting, you know that the child is from Jharkhand and you are suspecting a sickle. If you closely look at these indices, they will give you a clue as to what are you expecting at the genotype level or what probably would you get when you do an HPLC. So the next thing naturally when you've done your CBC, the next thing to do is to look at the peripheral smear, which will show you these characteristic sickle cells, which have basically tapered ends and these are hyperdense cells, thick at the middle and uh, thin or tapering with tapering ends. And besides these typical sickle, you also have some boat shaped cells and uh, some, you know, occasional uh, target cells. If the child comes to you with a sickle cell crisis, there would be 
more reticulocytosis than NRPCs on the smear. And uh, the degree of anisopoikilocytosis is much higher when there is a co-inheritance of beta thalassemia with sickle. That is sickle beta plus or sickle beta zero will show you more anisopoikilocytosis. And we have a lot of target cells in the smear, which again kind of point towards the presence of a compound heterozygosity rather than a homozygous sickle cell disease. So uh, I, I am sure that there will be hardly anybody in the audience who is not seen uh, such similar smears and day in day out we come across uh, these uh, cases it's just that when you look closely at the smears you sometimes you might uh, get a presence of a hobble jolly body which would indicate that there is some degree of aspenia or hypospenia when you see target cells then you would suspect that probably one of the parents is a beta and there is a co-inheritance of a beta mutation besides the sickle so once you have seen these sickle cells, it is uh, by default, the next thing would be to do a sickling test. In sickling test, what we are doing is we are producing a hypoxic state for the red blood cells. And uh, by sealing off by either uh, petroleum jelly, paraffin wax, nail varnish, or very frequently we even use BPX in our lab, we can add a reducing agent like sodium metabisulfide, which enhances the sickling. Normally, in a homozygous situation or a compound heterozygous with beta mutation or some other mutation, the homozygotes will show the presence of these sickle cells within an hour, whereas uh, the heterozygotes naturally will take a longer time, up to 12 to maybe even 24 hours. So, um, there can be false negatives because in newborns, naturally, the, number, the amount of HBF is very high, so that will retard the sickling. And we can have false positive tests when we have some other uncommon mutations where, again, the hemoglobin molecules can polymerize like hemoglobin cells. Don't ask me, this is theoretical, I have read it, so I put it over here that there can occasionally be false positive results also. So another test which can be put up when you see sickle cells in the peritreal smear is the solubility test. So the principle here is that the hemoglobin S is insoluble in a deoxygenated state in a high molarity phosphate buffer, which contains a reducing agent. So once this uh, HBS is insoluble, it tends to crystallize and refract the light. And subsequently, if you see, this is a sample, which is a normal sample, which, has, which is not showing any turbidity, and you can clearly see the lines behind it. Whereas a patient who's, uh, who's uh, homozygous or compound heterozygous for sickle will show you this kind of turbidity and those lines behind are not readable. So both these tests have their limitations and some degree of false positivity or false negativity. But overall, if you ask me, there is a good uh, specificity of these tests, specificity as well as accuracy. And it is naturally a, a requirement to show a positive sickling or solubility test once you suspect a case of sickle cell disease. So now that uh, you are suspecting a sickle cell, you have seen the presence of sickle cells, you need to now confirm that you have this uh, abnormal protein or this uh, mutation which is there at the, uh, sorry, not at the genetic level, but at the protein level. So this is a simple mixture where you have some alpha, HbA, HbF, and uh, HbA2f and so on different chains. So what we can do to separate this is we put them in an electrophoretic field and we tell them to migrate. And based upon their charge, these proteins can migrate at different paces and they tend to separate out. So this was just a diagrammatic representation and a cartoon of the same. This is basically the principle of hemoglobin electrophoresis, where the structural variants that have a change in the charge on the surface will separate out from HbA, A2 and F as uh, they are run on a membrane or a paper or gel in an alkaline media or in an acidic uh, media. The separation is largely but not entirely determined by the electrical charge of the molecule. So uh, when I was a student, this is how it was done in PGI Chandigarh. We used to cast, or I remember Madam used to cast the gels on the slide and using a cover slip, we used to apply the chemolysate and then a control and the abnormal sample on the samples to be tested were run. And uh, so this is a power source. Here is your buffer tank, which has a cathodal end and an anodal end. And the run of the hemoglobin molecules is basically from cathode to anode because at uh, alkaline pH, they all, all the molecules would be largely negatively charged. And this is an automated system where you have agarose gels, which are, this has now become much more easier and this was uh, relatively more uh, labor intensive. 
So here, simultaneously on a jet, you can run multiple samples. Ideally, you should run a control where you have a mixture of abnormal hemoglobins. So when your samples run, they, you can compare your results with what is coming in comparison to the control. So this is just a schematic representation of what happens when you run a hemolysate on an alkaline pH. So norm from this is the cathode and this is the anodal end. You have a faint band of K2. And uh, then major component in a normal healthy individual would, would be HbA. And just behind HbA, uh, we have HbF. But uh, these are the regions where, you know, other abnormal hemoglobins can also migrate, like uh, hemoglobin C, E, and O are will co-migrate with HbA2. Similarly, sickle D, G, and lepore migrate in between A2 and uh, F or A. And then you have these uh, alpha gene variants or the fast moving uh, hemoglobins like K, J, N, I, H, and so on, which migrate even more anodal to the hemoglobin A molecule. So this is uh, how you discriminate between a normal sample and an abnormal sample. You need to uh, run, you need to know what are the normal patterns. You need to have a sample to compare your normal width and uh, your sample width and so on. And similarly, there is a migration of the hemoglobin molecules differently on it. Acidic pH. Normally, alkaline pH is more commonly used than the acidic pH. The thickness of the band uh, roughly corresponds to the amount of that particular uh, hemoglobin. So, if this was the pattern for a healthy individual, suppose this is the pattern which we are getting for a fish child who is six months requiring blood transfusion. So, what we can see is that probably this is a post transfusion sample. You have some amount of A and majorly. F. So if I have a child who is presenting with this pattern, I'm probably dealing with a case of thalassemia major or a patient with homozygous beta thalassemia. If this is a pattern which is coming for, a, you know, maybe a 20 year old uh, patient who is asymptomatic, I need to know a little more about the history. I need to know the indices because this is the region where we can have S, T, G and so on. So the person, but if you look at it percentage wise, the amount of this abnormal hemoglobin is almost the same as that of the A. So this still could be a, 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 a heterozygous A or it could be, sorry, a heterozygous sickle or it could be a heterozygous D. So, uh, and in this situation, you need, really need to put up your sickling test. You need to look up at your smear. You need to do sickle solubility and discriminate S and D. Or what you can do is do an HPLC where these two, variants are separated out. Again, similarly, we have a, in the last line, we have a patient who is showing some A2 and your largely you have SD, your A is absent and you have some degree of F. So this could, this kind of a pattern could come either in homozygous D because we know that D also migrates with sickle. This could be homozygous sickle. This could even be a, a sickle with D and so on. So this is, these are some of the limitations of HP electrophoresis for which we need to resort to uh, HPLC where we can discriminate the two. And again, basic simple tests like signaling tests will help you to discriminate between a homozygous D or a homozygous S. So uh, back to our case. So suppose this is the uh, HPLC uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis of the child of interest, which we discussed, three year old. And so this is the pattern which we are getting on. Uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis. Now we need to again move on and compare. Since we know that we are dealing with a sickle, so there is currently no confusion that this could be a homozygous T. But still, when we do a confirmatory test further on HPLC, so I'll skip this, like what is already discussed, that this is a semi quantitative method, it is labor intensive, it does not discriminate all the different types of uh, variants which are commonly there, it will not pick up any coexisting alpha thal. So next week, what we need to do is the HPLC. I'll not discuss in detail the principle of HPLC because this was beautifully discussed by Dr. Reena Das in her uh, last presentation. But briefly, you know, there is a mobile phase where we have uh, different ionic strength buffers. And we also have a stationary phase, which is basically the cartridge through which our sample is injected. The buffer is passed through this cartridge in, at a, initially the low ionic strength buffer goes on and subsequently the high ionic strength buffer goes. And based upon the affinity of the particular hemoglobin molecule to this negatively charged cartridge, these buffer ions will gradually push for the abnormal variants or the normal variants out from the anodal end and these will be detected by the UV detector which is there and show the data in the form of a plot.
So this is a highly sensitive, specific, quick, but relatively expensive technique as compared to an entropy electrophoresis or you know, morphological examination and so on. Uh, so before you go on, go ahead and interpret a uh, abnormal graph, you really not need to know uh, how a normal HPLC graph looks like. What where are the peaks for HPF? Where is A zero? Where is A two? And so on, which I'll not be discussing here because again, as I said, it was already discussed by Professor Rita in her last presentation. So let us see what is my uh, case of interest uh, likely to show. So if we were dealing with a case of heterozygous sickle cell trait. There are some rules which we should know when before we interpret our uh, data. So normally in a heterozygous state, the concentration of HBS is usually between 35 to 45 percent of the total hemoglobin because the rate of synthesis of sickle is also slower as compared to peak. The degree of affinity the alpha chains have for the beta normal beta chains is reduced when there is a mutation of beta S in that beta globin gene. So and additionally, if there is a coexisting alpha thalassemia, so the normal amount of alpha chains has also gone down. So the amount of alpha chains which will come now combined with these sickle chains is reduced further. And in states with alpha thalassemia, your percentage of HBS will go down. This I showed previously in a case of that elderly gentleman. In a homozygous state, the HBS is likely to be 80 to 90 percent. In compound heterozygous states, when there is a co-inheritance with beta thalassemia, naturally you'll have to give a uh, place for uh, A2, which would be elevated, which will give you a clue that probably you are dealing with a uh, beta coexisting beta mutation. But what we should also remember is that some of the glycated uh, sickle hemoglobin can also, you know, fall in this HbA2 region and which can be result in the elevation of the HbA2. So that uh, this problem then uh, needs to be resorted by uh, parental screening. Uh, further, if we have a compound heterozygous state of sickle with some other structural variant, then since each chain is expected to produce 50% of the you know, hemoglobin, so we'll, we ha we'll have 40 to 50% of HBS and whatever co-inherited is the other structural variant, we'll have 40 to 50% of that particular variant. So uh, this is the HPLC of our patient. Again, I'll repeat the history, the three-year-old child, the Schwarzbachand, anemia, and abdominal pain, and so on. So what do we see over here? We can see that uh, there is an abnormal peak. The A is lost. The F is elevated to 15.7%. And the A2 concentration is also higher than expected. Normally, anything above four is uh, considered suspicious for friends of beta thalassemia trait or rather not suspicious rather we anything above four is kind of given diagnostic for the presence of uh, beta thalassemia co-inheritance of beta thalassemia but we should be careful because in sickle as i just said this a2 might be elevated because of the abnormal glycated hbs which can also fall back in this area so what to do now so what uh, we can understand is that there is no adult A and we have almost 74% or 75% of this abnormal peak which is likely to be due to sickle. So before you jump to you know a molecule mutation to resolve this issue, the best and the simplest answer is to say that do a parental screening. The parental screening will tell you what, what possible genotype is there which has resulted in this plot. There can be a, a co-inheritance with beta, there could be sickle uh, homozygous, besides homozygous sickle, you can have SC, SB Punjab, S Antilles, basically a compound heterozygous states for so many different hemoglobins which can clinically present as a sickle cell disease. So HPLC is otherwise a good diagnostic technique or a test which can help you to uh, resort and uh, you know understand what uh, is co-inherited with sickle cell and that can also easily be addressed by doing a parental screening. So this is the HPLC plot of the father. Here we have uh, a good going hemoglobin of 13.1 gram per deciliter. The indices are on the lower side. You have microcytic hypochromic anemia and a raised RBC count. So this is speaking for itself. When you did an HPLC, you have a A2 which is raised to 4.6%. So the father is probably heterozygous for beta thalassemia. Whereas if you look at the mother, the mother has an S window of 36.2. The A2 is normal, F is 2.4. Even indices wise, she doesn't really seem to be giving away anything as to what could be going on. So this is basically the mother is a heterozygous HBS, whereas father is a heterozygous beta thalassemia. And so it is easier now to conclude that probably the child is a heteros compound heterozygous sickle beta thalassemia. 
Besides HPLC, we can also resort to capillary zone electrophoresis, which is also a good diagnostic modality to identify the abnormal hemoglobins. Again, here you have a strong endosmotic flow of cations towards the cathode, which pulls the sample, which pulls all the abnormal peaks over here. There is a detector which will result and give you a graph and separate show you the separation of the different types of hemoglobin molecules. Here, the results are divided into different zones, like zone 1 to zone 15. And this is classic, uh, uh, this is a normal plot where you have HbA and HbA2. The different zones have their own labels. And if you bring your cursor to that particular zone, it gives you a drop down window and tells you that what all different variants can be present in that particular zone. For example, we have HbE in the, uh, zone 4 and uh, so on. So if uh, we go ahead and see the different patterns which can be obtained by capillary zone electrophoresis. Again, here we have a F in the zone 7. Then we have a zone for HBS. We have a zone for HBC. Here, um, one of the very good advantages of uh, this system is that it gives you a discrimination between A2 and E because both A2 and E are eluted in different zones as you can see over here. So this is zone 3 for A2 and zone 4 for HBE. Plus, this is also a very sensitive technique where a co-inheritance of alpha thalassemia or basically it is a good system to pick up. Alpha thalassemia, HB baths is readily identified and picked up by capillary zone electrophoresis as compared to a biograd variant 2 or an HPLC analysis which has relatively lower sensitivity for alpha thalassemia. So the final diagnosis in our, our, our case is a compound heterozygous sickle beta with co-inheritance of beta-0 thalassemia. So why beta-0 thalassemia? Because there is no A. Uh, the coexistence of beta has been documented by screening the parents, but otherwise also which we had, the points which we had in favor was there were microcytic emphasis, the A2 was raised, and the parental screening kind of clinched the diagnosis. Uh, since this co-inheritance is very common when you uh, start seeing patients with sickle cell disease, I'll just spend a few minutes on uh, what is the impact of co-inheritance of beta thalassemia with sickle cell. So they can be a beta zero state or they can be a beta plus. These zero and plus kind of indicate that whether there is almost no production of the normal beta chains or there is some production of the beta chains. So in a state where we have beta zero, there will be no hemoglobin A. The HBS within the red cells will decrease. The percentage of HbA2 and F will increase. And the, this lessens the likelihood of sickling and also lessens the degree of hemolysis. Uh, similarly, in patients with sickle with beta plus thalassemia, you will have some variable amount of HbA, but naturally the major component would be sickle and your A would be less than 50%, which would give you a clue that you are probably dealing with a sickle beta thalassemia. So though the um, severity of the disease decreases, but the, uh, but the frequency and the incidence of uh, painful crisis does not really go down uh, to that degree. And in patients, because the hemoglobin concentration in, improves, it is, said that it is said that complications like retinopathy are higher in these uh, patients. Uh, this is again a diagrammatic representation, or rather this is, these are the HPLC plots, sorry, from uh, the neck and uh, from our Barbara Bain where uh, you can see that this is a HPLC of a patient where there is co-inheritance with ORA. This is just to show that when you have a co-inheritance of other structural variants, the amount of uh, sickle as well as the amount of that structural variant is close to 40 to 50 percent. And this is, this is how you can discriminate or uh, identify the abnormal variants. So, <coughs> Let us see what uh, more can we do for this family. Suppose that the mother is now pregnant and uh, has conceived. So what do you think should be the role of the pathologist in this situation? There is a very important role of antiretinal testing in patients of you know, either homozygous or compound heterozygous uh, states of sickle cell. And uh, here, you know, you will largely have to rely on the molecular tests to guide the patient whether now is she carrying a uh, Sickle, uh, patient with sickle cell disease or not. And uh, this can be sorted out by doing either amniocentesis or we can do chorionic sampling as early as 8 to 10 weeks of gestation. And Professor Rina is doing excellent work on uh, cell-free DNA and fetal cells can be collected from the maternal 
circulation and the presence of the mutation can be identified even in the in those fetal cells and accordingly the patient can be counseled and uh, you know advised as to whether she should carry on with the pregnancy or she should not the commonly employed uh, molecular tests are rslp arms pcr or uh, le specific oligonucleotide hybridization and so on another important aspect of uh, sickle cell is uh, newborn screening india alone contributes to almost 15% of the world's uh, sickle cell anemia neonates so i think that this is definitely a pertinent problem and a point where we can you know we should introduce new newborn screening and uh, so if we look at what tests can be used for uh, newborn screening hplc ifc sorry this should have an isoelectric focusing and capillary zone electrophoresis all these uh, tests are recommended for all these technologies are sufficient to identify the presence of abnormal sickle uh, uh, hemoglobin and these are the graphs of uh, hplc as well as capillary zone electrophoresis as you can see that in a newborn the uh, hemoglobin is largely made up of hbf but when the child is carrying a, a is positive for sickle cell then up to 4 to 5% of a small peak can be detected even in newborns though this by this technique we can pick up that there is a there is presence of sickle uh, hemoglobin but this might not be sufficient enough to identify whether it is a compound heterozygous state or a homozygous state so to confirm that you can uh, to repeat this uh, you know uh, run when the child is a little older and uh, similarly in capillary zone electrophoresis largely you have f then you have small amount of a and again a small amount of s which is telling you that the newborn is affected by sickle cell disease uh this is a beautiful work done by uh, Ro uh, professor roshan kola and her team where they screened uh, newborns for uh, the presence of sickle cell disease in tribal population in the state of gujarat and madhya pradesh uh, for over a period of 6 years almost 9000 newborn babies were screened and again the screening was largely done by hplc and molecular analysis was done in a subset 128 patients were found to be positive for sickle cell disease of which 69 were homozygous whereas 18 showed a sick uh, a compound heterozygosity for beta thalassemia acute painful events severe anemia fever with infections were the major complications and these and 23 of these babies required hospitalization they were able to do a counseling for a majority of the individuals who had this these children and the parents were educated and counseled for home care as to how to go about manage these painful crises time and again so newborn screening even in a country like india is a very important uh, aspect of uh, this disorder and probably should be taken up as a you know uh, in other states as well to reduce the birth of these children with either sickle cell disease or sickle beta so when i did a literature search as to what is new in uh, the diagnosis of you know uh, sickle cell disease so this i came across this article which had some very new tests according to me but they are actually not really new there are uh, there was an image process they have uh, devised some image processing techniques where these sickle cells can be identified then there is an imaging flow cytometry assay and a software algorithm to identify those sickle cells then you have a lateral flow immuno assay also known as sickle scan this is almost like a you know pregnancy test where the cartridge is coated with monoclonal antibodies against hbs hba hbc and so on and you, when you uh, put a drop of blood and uh, passes through the cartridge it will give you a band if the particular abnormal variant is there so it seems like a very good uh, test for screening population then there was there were tests which are based on the density based separation of the abnormal hemoglobin and paper based uh, hemoglobin solubility tests so uh, anybody who is interested can refer to this article for reading up these tests in detail and i believe these are probably more in use or in practice where the prevalence of sickle cell disorder is high and you are usually screening uh, you know larger populations or individuals for the presence of this hemoglobin so to conclude uh, sickle cell disease is actually a multi system disease and not a typical hemolytic anemia as we should think of about it it does not the diagnosis does not require you know very high end tests and there are numerous genetic as well as non genetic modifiers which affect the clinical presentation so you will have patients coming to you at different ages with different type of clinical presentation 
A combination of morphology with HPLC of HP electrophoresis has reasonable diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. It's only in controversial cases, as I mentioned, that there are some other hemoglobin, like hemoglobin S antelus, C Harlem, etc., which can also show presence of uh, cyclic. And there you might have to resort to molecular tests to confirm that it is another abnormal hemoglobin. Otherwise, molecular tests are more restricted for use in antenatal testing and counseling of the patients. So this is our uh, team uh, in the department here at SCPJ. We have a, we are a joint department with both clinical and the lab arms. And here this is Aslam who is actually uh, run, helping to run these samples. And we are thankful to National Health Mission India which have sanctioned a thalassemia screening program at our center, which has helped us to, you know, uh, offer these services to people who are coming in our OPD or in the, from people from the nearby region. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful session and concise, in a concise manner. Almost all the aspects were discussed with intricate details. There are not much questions uh, left. But from my side, actually, I wanted to ask a few things. Like uh, you, uh, in one slide, you discussed that when there is a heterozygosity with the sickle, double heterozygosity with the sickle, and the uh, hemoglobin mean hemoglobin values which can come. So in many a time, there was the hemoglobin values with uh, double heterozygosity were varying from 11 to 13 even. So why to do HPLC in that case? How we can pick up HP? What will be the presentation of that patients? We will miss out those patients mostly. Right. So uh, mostly, frankly, if you ask me, uh, this part of teaching the role of uh, indices uh, in a case of sickle is because when you look at it, you actually see and appreciate that it's like that. But frankly, if you ask me, mera, my personal opinion is that these people are actually, in terms of CBC, they are very silent. You will never be able to identify a homozygous sickle who's never had a painful crisis, of maybe a female who's having a hemoglobin of 8, 9, or 10, and it might be messed out. You know, on, uh, till, unless, unless and until this patient has had some episode of, you know, a hemolysis or jaundice or a, a painful crisis because of which then these patients come forward for screening. And then you realize that, okay, that uh, this is actually a case of uh, homozygous sickle. Right, so yeah, that is my opinion. And even for a heterozygous state, so I think you know, unless until you do an HPLC, that uh, that person is actually a carrier for uh, sickle. Right, they say at least beta thalassemia, we get a clue that microcytic hypochromic yeah, indices and yeah. RBC count raised there and so on. A heterozygous sickle, to matlab, bilkul hi silent. Hai. Okay. And ma'am, uh, with the advent of HPLC and uh, other uh, methods, is there really any role in, in which setup we are still doing electrophoresis? And if we want to do electrophoresis, shall we do uh, both the alkal alkaline method along with the acidic method? Because there are many overlap of the with the sickle. Right. So as it is being taught that whenever you have an abnormal uh, hemoglobin, you should uh, document its presence by at least two different mechanisms. So one is that, uh, suppose in a homozygous uh, state, if you have a peak in the HPLC, it might be worthwhile either to do a sickling test or a sickle solubility test, or in centers where they are still doing HB electrophoresis, if you run it on the gen and show that, yes, it is coming in the SDG region. But uh, even in our center, and uh, we are now mostly doing uh, HPLC, and electrophoresis is done at very, very few places uh, to uh, sort out, uh, you know, to reach a diagnosis of sickle cell. Because uh, I think uh, maybe all pe people, uh, students who have passed, who have passed out from here, and you know, majority of the people have either D10 or they have variant 2. So that has now become more of a routine uh, test mechanism rather than HB electrophoresis. But yes, even HB electrophoresis, if you see it, is uh, relatively cost effective as compared to HPLC. So, where there is no HPLC, par, you, know, you can still go ahead and do. And uh, why yeah. HB CZD is more sensitive in picking up alpha thal? You are telling that it is, it is more sensitive to pick up alpha thal than the HPLC itself. Uh, probably, the uh, capillary hai na, and the way they, have, they are able to show the 15 different zones. If you see in HPLC, the six minutes run, uh, there's a chance that the abnormal variant will not pick up. Ho 
but however in capillary zone because probably of the uh, of the run and those donations jo abnormal peaks hai, they are getting kind of uh, you know resoluted wo migration jo unme zara zara sa difference hai that is getting picked up by capillary zone as as which is not getting picked up that easily by a hplc so if you see uh, this is the same principle in isoelectric focusing when isoelectric focusing is like hb electrophoresis mm. but it's with a more finer resolution so jo bands overlap karte hain hb electrophoresis mein wo isoelectric focusing mein resolve ho jate hain and you can identify uh, g and you know s and d separately as compared to what you can identify on a alkaline uh, gel electrophoresis and so ma'am wherever we get a hbs percentage just more than 25 but just below 30 we should always do for a hb alpha screening so in those uh, cases we uh, should go right we we should uh, screen for the presence of uh, alpha thalassemia and uh, so because you know and uh, if you go through that paper jo abhi dikhaya hai newborn screening wala hum karte nahi hai but when they have done their uh, newborn screening they have i think showed almost that 70% or 60% of their you know uh, patients with sickle cell disease had an alpha thalassemia and because itna itna zyada proportion high hai uh, in indian population ki aapka arab uh, indian haplotype hai f zyada rehta hai and probably because there is so much coherence of alpha thalassemia isliye painful crises and vods are relatively less in our uh, subcontinent it's just that we don't probably you know screen all these patients for alpha thalassemia isliye hum pakadte nahi hai but that is a clue on, on which you should probably go ahead and see Yes, and ma'am, when there is a coexistence of sickle beta, so when we are taking normally we are taking more than three point five to more than four percent. First, you have already discussed it, but still I want to ask in those cases which are having marginal A two with sickle cell, so in all the cases we should go for a parental screening first, and then we should release our report. Yes, I I would advise that, or if you want to release a report, you can always say that the possibility of a a uh, compound heterozygous state cannot be ruled out though uh, in fact i was uh, showing to uh, dinesh that uh, in badra bain jo unhone run dikha rakha hai heterozygous sickle cell ka usme unka a2 is 5.1 4.6 usko bhi unhone heterozygous uh, sickle hi likha hua hai so i was wondering so ki that the percentage of adapt can go up to that high but uh, so before you say or you think that it is a, comp- a compound heterozygous it would be worthwhile to screen the parents and also ma'am you told that mcv and mcg in the uh, mcv can be helpful because when there is a coexisting beta the mcv will be low will be low but mujhe kya lagta hai na moshni because of the reticulocytosis and uh, maybe if the patient yes. has had received any transfusion so shyer the you know aap khali predict hi kar sakte ho ya aap when you see the smear and uh, you see target cells and things you will just say ki probably a sickle beta niklega but you will actually have to go ahead and confirm it ki whether it is sickle beta or it is homozygous sickle okay ma'am thank you like a personal tuition i am taking with you <laughs> no ma'am there are many actually uh, thank you ma'am uh, for uh, answering all the questions and uh, uh, i will uh, can i just end the meeting here with the yeah, both of you and thank you ruchi ma'am thank you moshami ma'am thank you ma'am bye I'm ending. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.